embrace me. A touching reunion. So, what exactly is tension? There are many different ways to define it, but I think the best fit for today's video is a state of uncertainty and lack of knowledge. Tension creates a calculated vagueness over the outcome, an uncertain expectation of an event similar to suspense. It's to give the audience something to be afraid for, and, and what that means is something that would become an obstacle, some sort of conflict within your story. So, for example, in Outlast 2, our main character Blake is trying to reach his wife and escape the cult within the mountains. The tension could be the different factions like the cult under Papa Noth or the heretics led by Val that are preventing Blake from reaching his wife. They provide tension because they are constant threats to the main character and you never know when they will become an issue or if Blake will actually succeed. Basically, to create tension is to create questions. What's going to happen next or how will these characters get out of this situation? Now in general, games use tension in the same way as literature or movies do, but sometimes that tension can be applied to your own actions as the player. And that's what makes them very different. Such as, how will my character here, his name is Pooh Butt, overcome this boss in Elden Ring? The answer is I didn't, but if you're watching this live, the tension would be, will I succeed or not? I think you get the idea, and it's important to note that tension isn't strictly linked to horror or mystery, as I first thought. There are actually four different types of tension that a game can use, and I'll give you examples for each one. So, without further ado, my name is Josh, and I hope you enjoy. Now, the first type of tension is relational tension. This is the strain between two or more characters, usually two. This can even include two different factions like the Greys and the Braithwaites from Red Dead Redemption 2. This could be the tension between the main characters or even the protagonist and the antagonist. It, it really depends on the story game you're playing. So, I'll give you two different examples. Not her, you know. What? Maria told me about Sarah. Ellie? And you are treading on some mighty thin ice here. The Last of Us Part 1 is one of my favorite story games of all time, which by the way is getting a remake and I'm super excited for it, uh, but there is relational tension between our main characters Joel and Ellie. See, Joel is tasked with transporting Ellie outside the city to the Fireflies, but as they travel they face the infected, dangerous landscapes, some of the last people on Earth, but what I think provides the most tension in the story is the tension of their relationship. At first, they don't seem to get along, Joel only viewing her as some kid, but as they go about their journey, they start to form a father and daughter type of bond. The climax of their relational tension happens when Joel decides to let his little brother Tommy take Ellie the rest of the way there to the Fireflies. Ellie, when she realizes that Joel wants to get rid of her, runs off, and when Joel finds her, they have an honest conversation that emphasizes how much Ellie cares and how much Joel doesn't. Well, at least at this point in time. He brutally murders two guys in order to find Ellie later on, but we don't know how much he actually cares yet. This specific cutscene is one of my favorites because this story is really about these characters, so whenever they butt heads or argue, it matters so much more than in other stories. When it comes to how video games apply tension differently from movies or books, the reason is because they build that relationship differently, not only through cutscenes, but in-game dialogue. And within The Last of Us Part 1, there's quite a bit of it. Because you're playing as Joel and you're the one who discovers this dialogue or cutscenes, it makes those connections that much more intimate because you're the one who initiated that. Which again, I say, makes their arguments that much more tense because of what you've been through with Joel and Ellie. This is not only their adventure, but yours as well. Now, tension gives these characters such a realistic feel and you can't help but sympathize with their pain and struggle to feel that heartbreak. It's truly a phenomenal experience. Personally, these two are some of my favorite characters in all of gaming, and to see those moments of doubt and anger really brings it home for me. So now, let's look at another example, this time between the protagonist and the antagonist. That's alright. I believe it. No, wait! Did I ever tell you the definition of insanity is? Insanity is doing the exact... Scene. Far Cry 3 has one of my favorite villains of all time, uh, Voss Montenegro, and is pretty much the main reason why I played the game in the first place. I'm sure I'm not the only one, but yeah, he's freaking great. Besides being a delight to see on screen, he is a symbolic representation of what will happen to Jason, our main character, 
if he decides to succumb to the ways of the island. Jason has undergone a transformation that has changed him to his very core, first being traumatized by killing one person, to slaughtering dozens of people by trickshotting them. That's one down, that's it! It's quite a big difference. The relational tension here is summarized in one question. Will Jason become like Voss? Voss alone carries so much tension because he is a character of uncertainty. You never know what he's going to do next, or even better, what he's going to say next. Because sometimes what he says is very true, and some of the scariest villains in history are those who tell no lies. This creates an unknown of what or who Jason will become, and every time Voss is on screen, he is a reminder of what Jason is becoming, how the island is infecting his mind, and it's a different type of relational tension because the focus is more so on Jason and how much he has changed rather than the conflict between the two characters. Voss is more of a supporting role in this specific scenario, so it's probably not the best example for relational tension, but I really wanted to talk about Voss, so deal with it. Now this isn't to say that Voss alone doesn't create tension, again, he's one of the main threats in the entire game, but that's a different type of tension. That one is known as task tension. This one is pretty obvious, this form of tension revolves around what the main character is trying to accomplish, whether it may be the main plot of the whole story or a small scene within the gameplay. These are obstacles that stand in the way of our characters, which can take many different forms. One of them could be those stupid lockpicks in Dying Light 2 that I suck at. Or another could be the monsters or demons that prevent players from proceeding or finishing a puzzle. Like in every single horror game, or Doom, where you are the monster. However, this type of tension has multiple layers because in literature or movies, you get to read or watch what the characters are going through. In video games, not only do you know what task lies ahead, but as the player, you yourself have to do it. I gave a small example earlier in the intro about fighting a boss in Elden Ring, and while I did joke around with it, I'm sure those who have played the game or even watched others play it, feel that tension of whether they will succeed in their task, or, you know, beating the boss. If you've been on my live streams, you'll understand the tension that I have endured. In horror games, usually you have to turn on the water supply or generator because they're unoriginal, and what stands in the way is a monster or enemy that is stalking you. Again, the Outlast series does a phenomenal job of creating this tension because as the player, not only do you know that someone is blocking your way, that additional tension of being in control, or theoretically not being in control, is what really makes these encounters scary. Now, I mentioned there are four types of tension, but there are also like supporting characteristics in video games that help increase that tension, such as sound design, for example. I'm gonna keep on mentioning horror games because they do tension the best, especially in sound design. Some horror games have subtle yet disturbing music to unease the player, or in other games, their sound design is absolute silence. No music at all, but rather the environment to send chills down your spine. <laughs> How did that get into the video? Sorry, it's not like I'm the one editing here. But yeah, I don't think I need to explain this category of tension any more than I already did because it's pretty much self-explanatory. Now the next type of tension is surprise tension. <laughs> Didn't expect me to beatbox there, did you? Surprise, I, I don't know. Uh, this is another form of tension that is used widely with many games and other pieces of literature. It's pretty common because it gives your story more realism. Same with the previous two types, plus it adds a sudden twist that is unexpected and keeps the player engaged. Now there's two types of surprises, one where the player is shocked by something, or when the protagonist is shocked by new events unfolding. One of my favorite plot twists in all of gaming is in a small indie game named Before Your Eyes. It's a pretty cool story that is linked to your blinking, so every time you blink, it moves to the next scene. The game falsely tells you about the main character and his life, starting as a successful artist, but near the end of the game, you realize that his real story hasn't been told yet. The reality is, his life ended when he was just 11 years old because he died of cancer. It's such an emotional twist that brought tears to my eyes, which made it very difficult not to blink. But I can't give enough credit to the developers for making such an amazing plot twist that provides so much tension. Not necessarily in a bad way, but you're more so thinking about how will the Gatekeeper respond to this newfound knowledge. The Gatekeeper is this being that will let good souls into, like, heaven, so to speak, and our ferryman hypes up this encounter throughout the entire game. So all of what we do, all of what we experience, leads up to that last moment where we encounter the Gatekeeper. The tension of whether or not we will be let in was already there in the beginning, but with that sudden surprise of a new story being told makes it even more intriguing. And I, I love it so much. So this is a surprise in terms of the story, but let me provide an example where the gameplay provides a sudden twist that adds more tension. 
Monster Hunter is a game all about hunting monsters. I don't really think I need to explain that, and if I do, you're already too far gone. Uh, but there's really no surprises here. You pick a quest, and an image of the monster appears on the first page. But at least you know what you're expecting. That is, of course, unless you're hunting Kuro Pekko. Kuro Pekko is a neat bird wyvern that they really should bring back, but he has the ability to mimic other monster roars. So when all of a sudden this funny looking bird does this, I start to question if he just summoned the devil. Nothing happens for a moment, but then out of nowhere this huge dinosaur appears, and suddenly you're in the middle of a monster gangbang. Funny enough, this monster's name is Devil Joe, so I was kinda right. When you compare the two monsters, it doesn't take a whole lot of brain power to understand that this bird is an easier monster to fight, while Devil Joe can literally one-shot you when you first discover him, and this is how many players will find this monster for the first time. It's unexpected, it's exciting, and it's a wonderful form of surprise tension that not only adds tension for the rest of the fight, because he doesn't leave, but it gets you pumped to face Devil Joe once you're fully equipped. I remember when I saw Devil Joe for the first time during this fight, I was... I was scared. <laughs> Because I never heard that roar before, and to see this huge pickle come out of nowhere that can literally eat the monster that summoned him really had me nervous, and again, it's a really unique way of adding tension that only video games can do. Now the fourth and final type of tension is mystery tension. Not too hard to dissect here, mystery tension is to give the player something intriguing that doesn't make sense at first, but will later on. It's a type of tension that has this snowball effect, where the tension builds and builds until the twist or surprise happens, bringing it all together. This could be at small points in the story or the entire developing plot. So let me give you an example that has nothing to do with the story, but rather with online multiplayer. If you don't know, I love Smash Ultimate, it's one of my favorite fighting games of all time. Whenever you queue up to face a foe online, you're put in this waiting area, and once the other player arrives, you get this little ding sound effect, and that's when the tension starts. I have no clue which character I'm facing within the roster, or if the player I'm fighting against is good or not. It's something unique to video games, that mysterious tension of who will be my opponent. And most of the time it is Terry, I hate it, but you get the idea. Now, let's go to a different game that depends on the story for its mystery. Shadow of the Colossus. Shadow of the Colossus is a one-of-a-kind experience with more questions than answers that all revolve around the Colossi. The Colossi are these gargantuan creatures that really don't speak or have any backstory. We understand in the beginning of the game that we are hunting these behemoths in order to revive our waifu, but the question then becomes, do the Colossi have the power to resurrect? are the evil or neutral creatures that we are needlessly slaughtering. This game really makes you think about the purpose of these amazing creatures, their origins, and most of those questions, unfortunately, are left unanswered. All that mystery leads up to the Wanderer being consumed by the spirits of the Colossi. Don't really know what the correct terminology here is because the game doesn't give it to me, but he's become the host of all 16 Colossi, and he transforms into the main villain of the story. It's a really cool ending, but it still leaves so many questions unanswered. But the main thing to take away here is the mysterious aspect of the Colossi when fighting them. Throughout my entire journey, I was so curious about them, and each cutscene that played gave me a new puzzle piece, but I had no idea where to connect it. That undeniable doubt I had when stabbing their weak points made me question everything. And that mystery built so much tension because I expected an answer, a huge reveal that made it all make sense. Again, the ending kind of leaves you with more questions than answers, but I, I definitely recommend this game. I, I love Shadow of the Colossus. So with all four tensions defined and explained, relational, task, surprise, and tension, sorry, I meant mystery, <laughs> I hope you understand how games use those four categories. It's crucial for every game to have some form of tension because if no conflict happens or any sort of uncertainty, they become dull and a waste that leaves players bored and unsatisfied. But I hope you learned something today, and of course, I hope you enjoyed the video. I always enjoy making these video game essays. I just find them so much fun to like do the research and just kind of creating the script. But yeah, if you did enjoy, be sure to leave a like and to subscribe for more content like this. And I'll see you in the next video. Take care everyone, and of course, stay safe.